Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome you to the bridge. More than that, I'd like to welcome you to the bridge family and to a brand new year, our first service in 2020. I welcome you to a new sermon series, a new decade. I pray for some perhaps today before we're done. I welcome some of you to a brand new life in Christ. Now, with that quick introduction, I'd like to shift gears so that I can accomplish something that I've never done before. I pray that you and I can go through this experience and be blessed eternally. Here's my prayer. Here's my request. I'd like us to take communion together to begin this new time together, this new sermon series, this new year, this new decade And so I'm going to ask right now, if you would, to receive the elements as they're being distributed. And I have to also say, if you are not yet a biblical Christian, I ask you with all due respect to allow the elements to pass. You see, when we take communion, it's more than a religious ritual. It's Jesus who commanded his followers to do this, to take communion in remembrance of him. Now, again, that's more than a duty. It's a heart-centered, it's a heart-driven commitment to remember Christ our King. And if you are not yet a biblical Christian, while this is not yet for you, I pray that after today it will be. And that in the next time that we celebrate and take communion, that you'll be ready. And that you too would then be able to say, I want to remember what Christ has done. So again, as the elements are being distributed, I want to ask you to be thinking about, praying about, what does it mean to remember Christ? Why exactly do we, more pointedly, why exactly do you take this communion? What does it mean to you? Why would you do it? I want to ask you, if you would, as we prepare, to pray with me to come into this time, not only of communion, but also of this series. I pray that this will all make sense and come deep into your heart momentarily. Would you pray with me? Lord, I come to you now on behalf of those I serve, and each one that will hear this message at any time, And I pray on all of our behalfs that your word and your spirit will impact your people. That we will come to understand why it is that you would say to us, do this in remembrance of me. Now, I offer this all up in Jesus' name to his glory and by his grace. And I ask you now, if you would, to take the bread And as Jesus said to his disciples on the night before he would go to the cross, he would say, take this and eat of it. Take and eat in remembrance of me. Take the bread as a symbol of his broken body on the cross. And let us now together as a faith family, take and eat in remembrance of our Christ and our King. Amen. Now, I want to also say, as we lift the juice, that this too is symbolic of Christ and the blood that was spilled to save the souls of sinners that would repent and believe and receive him as our Lord and our Savior. I ask you again now, under the instruction of our Lord, to take and drink And to do this in remembrance of Christ, that he would receive glory and honor. And the family of God will do so. Amen. And amen. Well, let me ask you this. Now that we have taken communion to begin this new year, this new decade, this new sermon series, Let me ask you this question. What did you just remember? What did you remember as you took communion? On a personal level, what just took place? 
I'm wondering if perhaps as we come into worship, as we begin this sermon series, as we begin this year, might this taking of communion have taken some of you off guard? Might you have been caught a little flat-footed as we began by taking communion? I pray that if you've never before started a service or a sermon or a year or a decade by literally starting with communion, the remembering of Christ, I pray that after today you'll never be caught flat-footed ever again. That you will know why we remember, what we remember, how we are to remember. You see, we're going to go into this new sermon series that will take us probably deep into 2020. And it is entitled Gospel Gardening. Gospel Gardening. And I pray that you'll see what is the big idea for not just today, but this entire series. And that is that gospel gardening is Acts 1-8 in action. Let me say that again. Gospel gardening is Acts 1-8 in action. Now, for some, no doubt, you're not familiar with Acts 1-8. Let me tell you what these words from God's scripture tell us. They were the last literal words of Christ before he ascended visibly into heaven and left earth until he comes back again. He said, you will receive power when my Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses locally, regionally, and globally here in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, with that understood, I believe that it's essential, it's critical, it's eternally important that you and I understand the relationship of that truth, that profession, that command to go and be the witnesses of Almighty God, and that we understand that that's connected to what we remember about Christ, that we remember him best by being his ambassadors, by being the gospel gardeners who are living out Acts 1.8. Now, for our series, for our time together, we are going to look at this from a past, a present, and a future perspective. We will see from the very Garden of Eden, from the very beginning, that this was God's plan. This was God's promise. This was God's purpose. We'll see in the present tense that you and I have been called to be and to share the fruit of what it is to be the family of God. And that in so doing, we will be the very boots of the body of Christ. That we will see in gospel gardening that there is an essential need to understand the roots, the fruits, and the boots. We will look for and find Jesus the Christ in the Old Testament so that we understand who he really is. And in so doing, come to understand who we really are. We'll find that he has called us to exemplify the fruit of of the spirit to be the fruit of the saints that we would contrast the fruit of the snakes in that when we are being this body this set of boots that we will carry the gospel locally regionally and globally this is where we're going to go as a faith family and in so doing i pray we bring not only to those that are here but then we are equipped to bring to others elsewhere this truth that being gospel gardeners means that we will be Acts 1-8 in action. That we will carry the grace-based, blood-bought, miraculous and missional call to live out a Christ-likeness that embraces God's word, God's will, and God's ways no matter what. That this is who we are and to understand it biblically so that we can remember Christ that there is perhaps nothing as important as being the authentic witness for which we have received the very spirit of Jesus the Christ. Now, no doubt some have heard this, but not all understand it. And I want to give you one verse that will serve for this entire series as the umbrella verse. It's Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. 
Proverbs 29, verse 18. Everything that we look at from gospel gardening, the roots, the fruits, and the boots will all come under this umbrella. Let me share part of the verse with you that no doubt most will be most familiar with. And it's the King James Version that says to us, For a lack of vision, the people perish. For a lack of vision, the people perish. Now that lack of vision, I would suggest to you parallels directly for a lack of remembering. For a lack of rightly understanding and remembering Christ and what real Christianity is, the people perish. Now, let me share with you here a fuller explanation of this verse. Because you see, when this verse is accepted in kind of a loose application, what it ends up doing is it drives people to think that what you need is creative vision. And it gives rise to marketing plans. And you end up watching these people that build a church structure, a religious crowd out of creative vision. And that's not what the verse means at all. Now, of course, they'll tell you, no, that's exactly what it means. And in fact, if you don't adhere to it, look, the word of God says the people will perish. They'll die if we don't get creative with our big vision for the church. Well, let me share with you the whole verse. And let me share it with you from the ESV translation, because I think they do a very good job of giving it a fuller context. Here, Proverbs 29, 18, again, our text for this entire series says, quote, where there is no prophetic vision, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. So, yes, it is a matter of vision, but it's prophetic vision. And there is a perishing, but the perishing comes through the throwing off of restraint, what that means is, if we don't know what God's word really says, if we lose our sense of clarity and vision to what God's purpose and plans and priorities are, then we will perish because we will cast off restraint. We'll stop adhering to the word of God. We'll begin to drift, to disconnect, to dilly-dally, to disobey and ultimately deny and defy Christ. That's the message of Hebrews. You want to know why the people of Hebrews were doing this? It's because they lost sight of the prophetic vision, what God has said. And in so doing, they cast off the restraints that called them to faithful obedience. And in so doing, they rode themselves into their own demise. Now, the verse continues. Most people never hear the second half of the verse, but it then goes on to say, but, so here's the contrast, to those who don't have a prophetic vision and who cast off restraint, in contrast, but blessed are those who will keep the law. Blessed are those who adhere to, abide to, are truly living in obedience to God's word, God's will, and God's way. Now, I would say to you that this is at the heart of what it is to remember Christ. Now, let's again understand that over this next six months to a year, we're going to go deep into this understanding by looking at the roots of Christ and Christianity, the fruits that come out of Christ and Christianity, and what it is to be the boots of Christ and Christianity, all for his glory and all by his grace. Now, with that said, I'd like to jump in. Let's take that past perspective. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden. Let's see if we understand the roots of who Christ is and who we are in Christ or who those are that are not in Christ, those who are listening to the lies and the liars. I've asked Ligon Duncan to come and help me with this. Take a listen to what he shared a couple of years ago when I was at a T4G conference that gets right to the heart of the roots of Christ and Christianity. Watch this, and then we'll get right back to it. With me at Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. And God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created them, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Adam and Eve were created 
to find their supreme enjoyment in God and to image Him in this world. And this blessing into which they were created, notice in verse 28, is stated in terms of a command. Did you get that? The very first words that human beings ever heard from God was blessing. You realize that? The very first words that human beings ever heard from God was blessing. And God blessed them and said, and the blessing is stated in the form of a commandment. Don't miss that. In Genesis 1 and 2, in the original creation covenant, in what theologians call the covenant of works or the covenant of life or the covenant with Adam, Adam and Eve are brought into the world into blessing and the blessing is stated in the form of a command and the command itself is a blessing. So there is no contradiction between blessing and obedience. This is huge. Very often, Christians will view obedience as a way to condition God's goodness, love, and blessing. If I obey, I can get God to love me, be good to me, and bless me. That is, in fact, precisely what legalists do. If I, if I can be good, I can get God to love me, be good to me, and bless me, or I can keep God loving me, being good to me, and bless me. Notice, none of that is going on here in Genesis 1, 27, and 28. They are created, and, and before they take their first step, the first words that they hear from God is blessing. So the obedience commanded here in 128 is not there to condition God's love. It is the sphere in which they enjoy God's love. Here's how you're my image, and here's how you supremely enjoy me. Be fruitful and multiply and rule. Now, how's that imaging? Notice how the world began. Look at verse 1 of Genesis, uh, verse 2 of Genesis chapter 1. The earth was formless, void, and dark. And what does God do over the days of creation? He gives it order, he fills it up, and he makes it light. Now they're told, be fruitful and multiply, fill up the creation, be like me. So here's, here's what Adam and Eve are told to do in these creation commands. It's simply this, be who you are, which is to be like me. That's where you experience blessing, when you are who I created you to be, which is my image in this world. That's where you find freedom. That's where you find blessing. That's where you find joy. The obedience is not to condition God's love, to get God's love, to keep God's love. It's the sphere in which they enjoy God's love and His goodness and his blessing. And then look at what happens in Genesis 3. The serpent comes to Eve and says this, here's why God told you not to eat of that tree. Verse 5, Genesis chapter 3, God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. He's lying to you. He told you not to eat from that tree because he knows that if you eat of that tree, you will become like him. Now, what should Adam and Eve have said to the serpent at that point? What, what do you mean if we disobey God, we will become like him? We already are like him. Have you read Genesis 1, 27 and 28, Mr. Serpent? But they take 
and they eat, they disobey God, and do they become more like Him? No, they become less like Him. You see, Satan is saying, if you want to be like God, disobey. That's where your freedom is. Notice here that obedience in all of this is not the enemy. Obedience is not the problem. A misunderstanding of who God is and what he has given his commands for and the goodness of those commands, that is the problem. So let me ask you, do you understand why it is so important that we have this biblical vision? You see, without biblical vision in bullseyes, the phony baloney babble builders will ultimately construct consumeristic cultural crowds that contrast and contradict the true Christ-centered Christian churches. If you and I don't understand our roots, the fruit, and what it is to be the boots in gospel gardening, if we lose sight of this, we're going to go adrift into some very dangerous, eternally dangerous realities. So from this verse here again, without prophetic, prophetic vision, the people will cast off restraint, but blessed are those who keep, abide, obey the word of God. This is at the heart of what we see. And, and I want you to recognize as we look, not just today, but throughout this series, at gospel gardening roots, fruits, and boots, that what you'll find consistent throughout the scriptures, throughout God's word, is a call for this prophetic vision, for victorious fruit and valiant. That word means bold, courageous valor. It, it's to be heroic for valiant, faithful obedience in our living. If we don't get this, then we're not really remembering Christ when we take our communion. When we take and eat the broken body and the representative juice that is his blood, we're not really remembering him if we don't get the roots, the fruits, and the boots of Christianity. So let us now think back again to what we've learned about our roots, who Christ really is. You see, we're going to see in our time together through this series, we're going to see Jesus in the Old Testament. We're going to see him in action, like in Genesis 1, where John 1 tells us, there he is, he's the creator God. We're going to see him in anticipation and in the analogies, what some would call the types. We're going to see him as the second, new, better fulfillment of Adam. We're going to see him as the eternal ark that rescues us from the flood of sin and death. We're going to see him in Abraham and Isaac and how they point to our king and our Christ. We're going to see him in the applications, for example, in the building of the tabernacle. We'll see him in the feasts and in the festivities and the festivals that get celebrated. We'll see him in direct appearances, like when he comes into the burning bush with Moses. We're going to see him throughout, but ultimately, we're going to see him and learn about him in the roots of Christianity. Because if you take Christ out of Christianity, you're left with nothing but a hollow shell. You're left with nothing but cheap, superficial religiosity and rule keeping. And that's not Christianity. That's not gospel gardening. You see, if you don't understand our creator in his relationship to we the created, if you don't understand the real relationship between Christ and the church, then you're going to miss everything. And I fear be satisfied with something far less that not only doesn't save, but ultimately may damn. You see, it's only in understanding the biblical roots that we see not only our sin, but Christ as our Savior. None of it makes sense without these biblical roots. Listen, if you will, just for a few minutes to Alistair Begg, and he quotes C.S. Lewis in a way that I pray will help to bring this home into your heart. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity in chapter 5 uh, makes this point. It's quite a long quote, but it's purposeful. He says, If the universe is not governed by an absolute goodness— then all our efforts are in the long run hopeless. 
But if it is, then we are making ourselves enemies to that goodness every day, and are not in the least likely to do any better tomorrow, and so our case is hopeless again. Then he goes on to say, Christianity tells people to repent and provides them forgiveness. It therefore has nothing to say to people who do not know that they need forgiveness. So Christianity says, if you will repent, you will find forgiveness. So what possible relevance is that for somebody who is like the fellow we just read in Luke chapter 18, who comes to church to feel good about himself, who goes to the temple to rehearse before God the fact that he feels absolutely super? In fact, if you probably asked him what he got out of going up to the temple, he would say, I feel so much better about myself after I've gone up. Well, it's hardly surprising, because he's just talking about himself all the time and about how fantastic he is and how he isn't like other poor bums that are apparently showing up there and can't really look up into heaven the way that he does. Suez Lewis goes on to say, it is after you have realized that there is a real moral law and a power behind the law and that you have broken the law and put yourself in the wrong with that power, it is after all this and not a moment sooner that Christianity begins to talk. I find that very helpful. I wonder, do you? He said, this is only after you've discovered that there is a moral law, that there is a God who is the creator of that moral law, that that moral law has been broken by you, and that you can't put yourself right in relation to that moral law. Now we've got a story to tell. Now Christianity starts to speak to us because now we've found that there is a place somewhere that I can go that will resolve my predicament. Because, you see, the real question that presses in upon us, and genuine faith does not begin until it does press in upon us, is how can I get rid of my sins? How can I get rid of them? You see, friends, unless we have clarity and a prophetic vision on these roots— who Christ is, who we are, what the grand design and plan of God has been from the beginning and will continue to be, we're going to miss out. You see, the good news is not that you get to come to church, but that you can come to Christ. As was just said, it's not that, hey, good news, you're great coming in. No, the good news is you could be great going out. It's not that you're here to be made to feel good about yourself in your sin, but that you've come to grow in Christ, perhaps be convicted by Christ, that you can be saved from your sin. He didn't save you so that you can live in your sin. He saved you so that you could live out of and beyond, healed from your sin. And this is where we now begin to see the fruit. You see, when the roots are clear, and that prophetic vision has come in miraculously to the heart, then the victorious fruit begins to flow. Praise God. The victorious fruit begins to flow in the family of God. Now, there are three types of fruit that we'll focus on in this series. There's the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the saints, and the fruit of the snakes. Beware the fruit of the snakes. The fruit of the Spirit is what comes with the miraculous indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We're told in Galatians 5 that there are nine components, nine ways to see this singular fruit. That it is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are all attributes of Christ that if you understand the roots and are miraculously changed in the heart by his grace and his gospel, then the fruit of the Spirit begins in you immediately, immediately, because he brings it. This is what you and I see as part of the promises. And if, in fact, this is true, then now you, Christian, get to be those who distribute and reveal the fruit of the saints. Now here, Jesus again speaks in Matthew, and he, he speaks of this at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and he goes forward. You see, some would say, well, hang on now. I don't know about this whole fruit thing, but 
Jesus told the parable of the soils in large part to say that if you have been changed in the root system, then the fruit system of your life will genuinely produce a harvest, a crop, fruit, 30, 60, 100 fold. He says it will naturally happen. And in uh, Matthew 7, towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, He's speaking in contrast now about the snakes and the wolves, the false teachers, the bad soil. And Jesus says, as a part of the crescendo to the Sermon on the Mount, he says, oh, by the way, the good trees, they can't bear bad fruit, and the bad trees, they can't bear good fruit. The way you'll know the false teachers is by their fruit. You see, there is plastic, dead, phony fruit And if you and I don't understand this, if we don't get clarity, if we don't really embrace this understanding, we're going to miss so much and perhaps even be led astray. This is where you and I come to see that God has called his people to be the people of the fruit producing nature, that our family is a family that is out farming and producing fruit not by our own strength, but through the power of his Holy Spirit. And we're to watch out for those who are producing that snake-like, phony, wolf-esque, plastic dead fruit. Watch out. Don't be tricked by what they look like or sound like. Evaluate the fruit. He said, where my spirit is, you will find the spiritual fruit that validates my presence. Where my people are, you'll see the flowing of their fruit in their lives, 30, 60, 100 fold. They'll look like me. They'll smell like me. The aroma of Christ will come out of their lives. Yeah, some are going to say it smells like life and some are going to say it smells like death. But the authentic presence of the fruit in their lives speaks so loudly. Now here again, this was what Jesus wants you and me to understand. What the word of God says, that all of our lives are to be a portrait, a living out, a sharing of this fruit because it exemplifies him. This is fruit of the spirit that gets lived out through the fruit and the lives of the saints. And this was again the plan from the beginning. Watch this, I pray, and be inspired. Turn with me to Leviticus 19, because here's, you know, what a strange place to go, Leviticus 19. What in the world are we doing there? Um, Well, I mean, for one thing, because if you look at the whole of of Leviticus 19, you will see what it essentially is, is it's a rehearsal of the Ten Commandments. Now, notice what he's doing. He's saying, I want the whole of you in all your interactions to be like me. Sound familiar? I want the whole of you in all your interactions to be like me. I want you to be personally, familially, congregationally, and socially like me. In other words, in your personal life, in your family interactions, in your, in your interactions with other believers in the congregation, and with your interactions with your neighbors, I want you to look like me. Does that sound familiar to you? You are my image. I want you to look like me. And let me tell you what I look like so that you will know what I want you to look like. And let's, let's just look at what he says. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Here's why you should want to be holy. I'm holy. Now, what's the logic of that? You were created in God's image and redeemed to bear that image again. And one day, that image will in glorification gloriously and perfectly shine for eternity. So let's get started now. In other words, holiness is specifically said here to be manifested in the observable obedience to the first and second table commandments. That's how you image God. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. 
That is the only place that is said in the Old Testament. It's not said in Exodus 20. It's not said in Deuteronomy 5. It's said right smack dab in the middle of Leviticus 19, along with a lot of ceremonial regulations. In other words, Moses gives us the content here of neighbor love. It's not some airy-fairy, high-flown ideal that nobody can define. He makes it crunchy and tangible. Don't be telling me you love your neighbor and then you go slandering your neighbor. Don't don't be telling me that you love your neighbor and you are unjust and you show partiality against your neighbor. Don't, Don't be telling me that you love your neighbor but you oppress your neighbor or you lie about your neighbor or you steal from your neighbor. In in other words, neighbor love is something very, very tangible. And what is it? It is an expression of the image of God. God is like this. This is how God acts. Be like this. Now, this verse in particular, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, is clearly not part of some passed away ceremonial Old Testament ordinance. It's picked up a dozen times or more in the New Testament. And Jesus in particular. And Jesus deploys it to attack the kind of legalism that he is encountering in the religious leaders of Israel. A lawyer comes to him in Luke 10, 25, and he says, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Heard that question before? What what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, What's written in the law? How does it read to you? And the lawyer says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and your neighbor is yourself. And Jesus says, you're right. You're right. You have answered correctly. And then what does he say? Do that and you'll enter heaven. Do that, and you will live. Now, again, is Jesus preaching salvation by works? No, and you're going to see it real quick. And listen to the next words from this man, verse 29, Luke 10, 29, wishing to justify himself. Legalists are self-justifiers. He said, and who is my neighbor? Now, here's the other thing you need to understand about the legalism of the Pharisees in Jesus' time. While presenting themselves as fastidious in their keeping of the law, they were always looking for loopholes. The Pharisees' great question was, when does the law not apply to me? So legalists present themselves as concerned about the law, but all the while they're looking for loopholes. The lawyer with with desires of self-justification says, and just exactly who is my neighbor? And Jesus says to him, that's not the question, my friend. The question is, are you a neighbor? You see, see what he was trying to do? He was trying to delimit who his neighbor was. He was looking for loopholes. He was asking the question, when do I not have to obey the law to love my neighbor? And Jesus says, you're ask- by the way, Jesus does this all the time. Jesus doesn't just give good answers to bad questions. He'll tell you when your question is bad. You know, people always say, Jesus taught by asking questions. A lot of times those questions are saying, you know what, your question stinks. Let's let's talk about a better question. your, Your question and just who is my neighbor, it stinks. This question, however, is a good question. Am I a good neighbor? Don't be asking, is there are there people out there that I don't need to be this way to? Can we get a list of them so I know who that is? It's, am I a good neighbor? You see, the the Pharisees were trying to ask the question, when does God's law not apply? 
And Jesus is showing to them what? They're not whole. They're trying to look godly on the outside, but from the inside, they have hearts that do not have compassion. And who is my neighbor, Jesus? I hear somebody speaking behind that. Do you? Has, has God said that you shall not eat of the fruit of that tree? I wonder if that's sinking in. Do you realize that if you don't get the roots, you won't recognize or understand, and you won't be able to share the fruit that is coming with and through him. This is what's so important, that until you and I understand the roots and truly have the spirit-gifted fruit coming out of our lives, we'll never have a chance of being the boots. Now, I want to show this to you in real life, real context, brothers and sisters, people that you know and love. I want to share what happens when clarity of the roots and the reality of the fruits begin to flow, what it looks like as a family, as a couple, as a brother and sister in Christ begin to press in and see God at work, calling and equipping them through the roots, with the fruits to be the boots. We are the recruits in God's boots as the body of Christ Let me show it to you in a way that I pray blesses and inspires you from right here at home. Hey, Bridge family, this is Jordan. Hey, Sierra. I'm going to share with you uh, today um, our testimony of uh, where we once were and where we are today. Um, When I was growing up, I went to church a lot with my grandmother, but... uh, once I kind of got of uh, of age to make uh, a choice of my own, um, I wasn't going. And then um, like around my senior year of high school, I started going back again. Um, when I went back, I'm really trying to um, be a Christian, like learn the Bible, you know, the do's and don'ts. Um, I got burnt out. It was very tiring, um, the whole, um, what's the word, like all of the antics that came with it, um, it was very, very frustrating, um, I would hear a lot of preaching on, like, uh, prosperity and, um, God wants to bless you, but you got to get here for God to bless you. Um, Or um, God wants to give you this, but you have to do this. And um, I was doing those things, but um, nothing was happening. And um, a lot of answers um, that I heard when I would, you know, tell someone, they would say, oh, you have enough faith. You got to believe more. You got to tithe more. So... It was always my fault um, on why something wasn't working. Um, then um, I met Sierra, and uh, we were, you know, talk about our churches, and I would always complain about what was happening at uh, my church. Um, and she was, you know, suggest that I say something or you know do something about it, but at the time. Um, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. Um, I knew that uh, I didn't want to be anymore. And then once we got married, you know, she started to attend too. And you know, she definitely didn't want to be there. And it frustrated me that um, I didn't know, you know, what God wanted me to do. And it was frustrating to know that she was frustrated because we weren't. Um, moving and it felt and we felt like stuck um, but through much prayer and just you know hearing um, the gospel preached um, from Jeff Durbin um, 
the pastor on YouTube that Sierra introduced me to, just hearing him and then hearing what I was hearing on Sunday, it was like night and day, two different things. Um, but uh, I felt God was really drawing me then. Um, the first uh, thing that I heard was about salvation, um, which is very important. Um, I didn't know if I was saved after hearing that sermon. Um, and Sierra asked me that, and I, I told her I didn't know um, if I was, you know, truly saved. And, you know, in the midst of all this, uh, not knowing if I was saved, not knowing uh, if we should continue to go to that church, um, just a number of things. Um, Sierra comes home and she tells me about this girl named Jess. And uh, she can tell you about that. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think during that time, um, we both were just kind of um, in confusion with understanding what the church was about and what we should be doing at the um, church. So um, I was on YouTube and I used to see a lot of videos um, of different sermons and um, discipleship uh, topics they were preaching about. and. It was um, some of Paul Washer and uh, Jeff Durbin and Dr. James White, and really seeing the contrast with that and with the things that I've heard growing up um, in the churches that I've attended, there was a lot, a big difference. Um, they were really basically presenting the truth about the gospel. It wasn't a half truth or some of the truth or um, a cherry picking of scriptures to fit what you wanted. It was really the gospel and what Christ came to do and what, what in response to that, what is our um, mission to do while we're here. And when I um, was hearing this and I was working at DSW, I met Jessica and she came in one day and we were just talking about the gospel, about life and how, um, how important it is that we know what we know as Christians, what, understand why we know what we know. And, being able to share that with others. Um, and it really was just refreshing to, um, to see that there are other believers out there in true churches that are bringing forth the truth of the gospel. And um, when we went to go visit the bridge um, for the first time, and it was a, a message of me getting to do something for Christ. It's a privilege and an honor to worship and to, to serve. And it was a lot different from what We've heard, you know, I, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. but, um, so yeah, it was, it was really, um, eye opening and God is really just doing the work in our hearts to, to grow us in understanding and the knowledge of who he is. And, and it really like brought us, it brought us to Christ and understanding, yeah. understanding his love for us and, and it opened our hearts to want to love and share with others. Um, so it's really just been a blessing being at the bridge and uh, I'm just grateful to God for opening our eyes and continuing to sanctify us in his word. You see, when the roots take up and drill down deep into the heart and the fruit begins to flow out of those roots in Christ, you start to become the boots. And this is a want to. It, it's not a have to, it's a want to. It's a get to. You, you heard there, it, it's John 6, God is drawing and the people of God are responding. You don't need to be entertained. You don't need a massage. You're not looking for the things that satisfy the flesh. No, when the root system has grabbed a hold and the fruit begins to flow, then the boots are going to start marching for the Messiah. We begin to be those missionaries with a zeal and a passion, Titus 2.14, that will declare these things and exhort and rebuke with all authority, letting no one disregard you, Titus 2.15. This is the get-to. Now, let me just, if I can, bring it back to a place that I pray will inform, inspect, and perhaps I pray inspire you 
as we come down and we begin to close, let me just show you again. It is the roots, the fruits, and the boots that Jesus has made clear. This is who we are, church. If you want, like Sierra, to understand who it is that we are to be, let us get this prophetic vision so that we won't cast off restraint, but instead we'll be the blessed people that adhere to and obey the very word of God. Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus, now speaking, he says in Matthew 9, 35 through 38, here's commentary and then the voice of our king, quote, then Jesus went throughout all the towns. Jesus went throughout all 52 towns and villages of the Northeast Kingdom, across all the villages of Uganda and South Sudan and the Congo, across all of the Eastern Shore and across that big bridge into Annapolis and towards DC, all the way across wherever God will lead. Jesus went throughout all the towns and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news, teaching and preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, ask, I ask you now, do you remember this part of Christ? Did you remember this when we took communion? That when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. He had compassion on them because they were bewildered and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then Jesus said to his disciples, quote, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The harvest is high quantity, high quality. The harvesters, low quantity. For the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, what do we do? Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. The boots of God, the body of Christ, the bride of our King. We belong in the harvest fields. The boots of the bride will go to the fields and faithfully fish for men. You see, if you really remember your roots and you really have the fruit, you'll really want to be the boots let me just ask Ligon to close out his time with us by remembering how this all comes together. See the purpose, the promise, the power, the priorities of what it is to be these gospel gardeners because we know our roots. We have our fruits. We will be his boots. Watch this. We've got to believe what he says in the word. We've got to absolutely tenaciously king, uh, cleave to his truth, but we've got to double down on love and compassion because we're going to obey the second commandment, right? So how can you be saved? Because the Savior came and obeyed the first and second great commandments. You remember what he says? It is my food to do the will of him who sent me. In other words, he's saying, Lord, getting to obey your law is like sitting down at a seven-course meal. I, I love to obey your law like I get to tuck into a feast. It is my food to do the will of him who sent me. And then he got treated not as a neighbor, but as an enemy in our place. And then in laying down his life, he treated his enemies, you and me, as not only his neighbor, but his friends. That is what releases you from condemnation and sets you free to love your neighbor who you often do not love. And on the Lord's day, when you come to the Lord's table for the Lord's Supper, I want you to hear some words that Jesus says to you, it's just so you'll know this. You come to the table and he says to you, here's what I want you to do. Take and eat. Oh, what's going on there? The last time I heard those words, things didn't work out so well. She took and she ate. And Jesus says, watch this, Satan. Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Amen. 
So small a thing it seemed, taking that fruit. So hard in undoing. It took God sending his son into the world and to the cross before take and eat became verbs of salvation. And that is what enables you to love your neighbor. Because you were saved not only to be declared not guilty, but to be set free from the bondage of sin so that you could finally be who he created and redeemed you to be. And what does that look like? Loving God and loving your neighbor. Let no one say that anyone can outdo you in love. Friends, my prayer is that each one of us within the sound of my voice wants to be these gospel gardeners. That you and I understand what took place there and when we remember Christ, not just when we take communion, but every day, that as gospel gardeners, we will bring the good news that says, take and eat. That we will be the ones that bring the good news that yes, it starts with sin and your need for a Savior. That in our roots we understand we are a people of repentance who then get to be redeemed and come into restoration. And that's when the fruit will flow. And that's when the boots will begin to march for our Messiah as missionaries who have been miraculously saved by grace and put out into the world because we recognize that we, above all other people, we need to see what Jesus saw. We need to feel what Jesus felt so that we will go and do what Jesus did. We have been saved to serve as his ambassadors. That we get to be the family of God. If that's of interest to you, if perhaps you personally or those that you know and love have struggled with what it means to really biblically understand Christianity, then I invite you to come with us in this series. As we unpack, looking back into the Old Testament to see Christ and what it means to be today a Christian. As we look into the present and we see what the fruit in the family of God really looks, loves, and lives like. And when we understand and unpack what it is to be the boots, the very Christ's church that the world so desperately needs, I invite you to come. Come and see who Jesus died to create you to be. That what yours and my life should look like as we live out this relationship. I want to pray to close, but I'm going to leave you with one last video that should serve, I pray, as an exclamation mark of inspiration. You see, for those of you that have been with us, you know that literally I came back home from Uganda in November after having spent extensive time with our Ugandan family, with Moses, who, praise God, is with us today in our Maryland family, with Isaac and with Jackson. And we did extensive discipling because we knew God was beginning to spread the boots of the body. The bridge boots were being spread across Uganda. And when I left, praise God, out of Kampala, Moses went to prisons. Isaac began to lead and serve in Kuwempe. And Jackson said, God's calling me to Wayale. And then out of Wayale, he said, to begin to serve and to equip the South Sudanese refugees who will go back up into South Sudan. And then he said, I feel called out of Wayale to go even further to Nebi. And in Nebi, we found on Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve, I shared with you a, a portrait of what God was doing because people were coming from across the border of the Congo to here. And Jackson was blessed as a bridge brother to share this good news, to be the boots, share the fruit, to explain the roots. And I left you on New Year's Eve with a to be continued. Well, I pray that today you see gospel gardening in a way that is very personal. This is our family, Bridge. 
This is our small, humble family of faith who are committed to the roots, who've been blessed with the fruits and are now ambassadors in boots going across borders. We are Acts 1-8 in action. We are this family. I pray whether it is across the mid-Atlantic region spreading out from Kent Island to the eastern shore or the western shore, up here in the northeast kingdom of Vermont, cutting across all of the 52 towns and villages, going into the prisons, meeting in the soup kitchens, or if it's in Uganda, where we've now been given access to the prison system, where we're now spreading across literally 10 different parts of the country and now, praise God, being brought into South Sudan and not just being brought, but going into the Congo to share what I now share with you, a continuation of what it is to be the roots, the fruits, and the boots, these gospel gardeners that Christ came to give life to and this was the plan from the very beginning and it will be until the very end lord i pray that your word your spirit and your people were unified here today and that you did an eternal work that's just getting started praise god it's in jesus name we pray together giving you all the glory and thanking you for all the grace amen and amen Lynn Lassler was number 10, which I really enjoy, mm. joining God. Uh, at times we find ourselves, even I've just learned this from him, that are we doing it his way or our way? Yeah. Uh, because in, at times we find ourselves that we may be sharing or doing God's way, but again at times we find ourselves being tempted or having different things in, things in our mind, we try to drive ourselves from doing it his way, then we overchange, pull away from him, or do things which are not godly. Mm. Yes. Uh, second, we did. We went through the vision.